Good morning. It's uh, Kevin DeClaren once again. It's uh, Tuesday morning, the uh, 20th of, uh, of September. And i um, going to uh, see if I could uh, preach a message here this morning. And uh, hopefully uh, the people will understand where uh, God is coming from, uh, from his word. And... Uh, and also why God calls them to uh, to repent. Why there is a message of repentance? Because people don't they don't seem to understand that this is important um, every single day of their lives. It's not just something that happens once in a while, but it's every single day. It's a it's a daily occurrence. Something that happens daily, not just once in a blue moon. Uh, I don't know how they're going to respond. I'm not sure if there's going to be violence or hate or hits, but we'll see what the Lord does with uh, with this situation here. It's not a good situation. It's a bad situation because it involves my own personal life. I'm preaching. There's not too many people here. Um, I'm going to show you the area. It's, uh, that's, uh, that's Pioneer uh, Courthouse right behind me. That's the Macy's over there, and that's the hotel. And as you can see, there's not too many people out here. Pioneer Square has a bunch of people, but this is... Um, I'm basically... What I'm doing is I'm continuing from where I left off on Sunday um, based on their response to the message. Their response to the message was kind of awkward, and uh, they didn't understand why I, I would preach on God needing change um, and there's nobody out here Pioneer Square is the same thing there's nobody out there so whoever has ears to hear you know um, I know the government has microphones and uh, they also have uh, cameras all over the place so I'm sure God has the right people out here to hear this the message and uh, we'll see uh, what uh, What happens next? All right. Father, may you bless this this time of preaching. May you open the minds of uh, the unbelieving, and uh, may you uh, calm the hearts of the anxious. And uh, the church is not out here to fight these people. The church is out here to help these people. out right there um, we're here to try to resolve an issue that's affecting every American life and so Lord I pray that you would uh, help the people understand that this is where change begins and takes place um, right here where the gospel is being preached and right here where where the where the work of the ministry is being done in Jesus' name we pray. Morning, Portland. Today is Tuesday, the 20th of September 2016. Now, a lot of you are probably not going to be able to hear me because I'm not shouting a whole lot this morning. But I wanted to give you an update on um, what has taken place since uh, Sunday when I last preached. That message on change. I sort of walked away feeling like people didn't really understand um, where I was coming from. But I can assure you that a lot of changes has taken place in each one of our lives since 
Sunday. Sins have been committed. Some have been laid to rest. Others have been born. And probably wars have been declared. But the bottom line is that we have to deal with this gospel whether we want to or not. Whether we're living in secret or we're living secret lives or public lives, whatever it is that we're doing, God sees it all, according to Psalms 139. But as I begin this message, I want to read you something from um, Our Daily Bread. It says here, connecting the dots. This is from Our Daily Bread. And the writer says this, in the 1880s, French artist George Seurat introduced an art form known as pointillism. As the, as the name suggests, Seurat used small dots of color rather than brush strokes of blended pigments to create an artistic image. Up close, his work looks like groupings of individual dots. Yet as the observer steps back, the human eye blends the dots into brightly colored portraits or landscapes. So here is a man named George Surratt, and instead of using brush strokes to paint landscapes, he uses dots, little dots to create landscapes. And when you step away from the, the painting or the picture, the dots blend in together as if it's a completed picture. The author writes and says this. He compares what George does with what the Bible is doing. He compares what George does in connecting the dots to create a picture with what the Bible is doing. And basically what I think he's saying is we need to connect the dots, right? The dots are not connected for us, therefore we need to take a step back and connect the dots of information that God is giving to us. So the big picture of the Bible is similar. Up close, its complexity can leave us with the impression of dots on a canvas. When you step up to the Bible and you look at it, you're seeing a bunch of information, like a bunch of dots on a canvas. The author says, as we read it, that is, as we read the Bible, we might feel like Cleopas and his friend on the road to Emmaus. So now the author takes an example out of the Bible using two names, Cleopas and Emmaus, and he wants us to understand what he's saying here. He says, Emmaus and Cleopas, who were friends, could not understand the tragic dot-like events of the Passover weekend. Cleopas and Emmaus could not understand the tragic dot-like event of the Passover weekend. So he goes 2,000 years back. He says, um, they had hoped that Jesus was the one who was going to redeem Israel in Luke 24, 21. But they had just witnessed his death. So these two Jews were hoping that the Christ, Jesus, would have been the one to redeem Israel from the Roman Empire. From under the tyranny, the oppression, the suppression, the slavery that the Roman Empire had brought into their lives as Jews taking over all of the countries around the Mediterranean in the first century. But instead of looking at a Messiah that would deliver their people, they're looking at a dead Messiah who claimed to be the savior of their souls from sin. The complete opposite of what they were looking for. So the author says, suddenly a man they did not recognize was walking alongside them, going back to the biblical account of 
of these two men, these two friends. He says, suddenly, as they were walking, a man comes alongside them. After showing an interest in their conversation, he helped them connect the dots of the suffering and death of their long-awaited Messiah. So, Emmaus, actually Cleopas and his friend, on the road to Emmaus, here I was using the word Emmaus, Emmaus was the city, my, my fault, the correction. Emmaus was the city that they were going to. So Cleopas and his friend are walking and a, a stranger out of nowhere comes to do what? To talk to them and to help them understand what this tragedy had been that had just taken place in their city. And, um, and he explains to them what these, you know, these events meant. So like the dots on a canvas, he helps them understand why Christ had to die on a cross. He probably explained to them from Isaiah all the way to the first century when they were walking why Jesus had to die for their sins. So the author continues and says this, Later while eating a meal with them, Jesus let them recognize him, and then he left as mysteriously as he came. So the stranger who stepped up to Cleopas and his friend on the road to Emmaus disclosed himself as being the Christ, as being Jesus. And he basically, while they were sitting at a table eating dinner, he he revealed who he was. He allowed them to see who he was, and the same way he mysteriously stepped up to them when they were walking to Emmaus is the same way he mysteriously disappeared back out of their lives. So the author continues and says, Was it the scared dots of the nail wounds in his hands that caught their attention? While they were sitting at the dinner table, they saw a nail wound in his hands. Was it the wound in his hands that gave him away? That's what the author is saying here. It caught their attention. Perhaps when he's grabbing the bread, or perhaps when he's grabbing the cup. We don't know, the author says. What we do know is that when, the, when we connect the dots of scripture, and Jesus is suffering, we see a God who loves us more than we can imagine. So here the author says, we don't know what it is that gave Jesus away. We don't know what it is that gave Jesus away after helping them connect the dots to the event that led to his death. The author said, what we do know is that when we connect the dots of scripture, like George Surratt connected those dots in his artwork of landscapes, we connect the dots of scripture, and Jesus is suffering, we see a God who loves us more than we can imagine. So when you connect the dots of scripture, what do you see? God's love. God's love in creation, God's love in the crucifixion, God's love in the resurrection, God's love in calling us to repent of sin. God's love in calling us not to practice idolatry, but to do what instead? To trust in Him. To trust in Him. The final statement of the author is Jesus laid down his life to show his love for us. To show his love for us. Now let me ask you a question. What is so horrible about that message of God's love that makes us cringe and causes us not to want to repent and receive God's love. This is what the author is saying is God's call out of his love. When God says to us repent, it's not because he hates us, it's because he loves us. 
The message of scripture is a message of love, not a message of hate, not a message of downtrodden and, and hurting people. God knows and understands our suffering. He knows and he understands our suffering. That's why he says we need to repent of our sins so that he can become the object of our worship. Now, after I was done preaching here, okay, we have to get greasy and naughty. After I was done preaching here, I went up to the university, PSU, to upload the video so that the rest of the church and whoever else might be interested in looking at it, the message about, um, you know, coming from Exodus chapter 20, God saying, thou shalt have no other gods. Psalms 135 that says, um, you know, God is above all gods. And then the other scriptures that basically leads us back, Revelations 22, 9, that says to worship God only. And of course, we looked at the fourth point, and that was that there's a, a bunch of gods out here misleading the people, mis misdirecting the people to do things that are not necessary, to live lives that are not necessary, misleading us to practice things that are not necessary. So when I went up there, I guess some people didn't agree. I didn't know who they were with, with the message that came from the scripture about God being the center of our lives. And they started dropping me hints. And hint after hint after hint, inside, outside. I mean, I don't know who they were, but the hints were so clear to me that I had to ignore them. And the one, number one hint of any unbeliever is always go sexual. Take it off. Come down. Come out. Come over to this side. We'll give it to you. But the word of the Lord says opposite. Flee youthful lust. Abstain from sexual immorality. Don't do that. Don't go in that direction. Because it brings about the wrath of God. So Sunday afternoon, until Sunday evening, I didn't do what I was asked to do. I went home, ate dinner, did a few things and went to sleep. When I woke up the next day, there was a cut in my hand. And I thought, well, that's peculiar. Why, why should there be a cut in my hand? Because as I was preaching, somebody walked by and says, ooh, you're in trouble. Why was I in trouble? because I'm addressing an issue that matters to all of our lives. I'm addressing an issue that is affecting every household in America, but the Bible says that we suppress the truth of God's love. We suppress the truth that God wants us to know. Why do we suppress the truth? Why does it bother our minds to think that God loves us so much God loves us so much that we can do what? We could turn to Him by faith for salvation. So I decided, okay, that morning I wasn't happy and I expressed my unhappiness to the community or to, the, to, to where I was living at, stating that it was ridiculous to have a lease and to have someone come in and continuously cut and peers. Now, I used to write incident reports. I would write the incident reports and give them to the management and say, hey, somebody's coming into the apartment. You know, we, this isn't part of the lease. This isn't right. Nowadays, I write the lease, I write these incident reports, and guess what I don't do? I don't turn them in. I don't turn them in anymore. I keep them as a collector's item as I hear it, I keep them as a collector's item. Something to remind me of the other side of the lease. Something to remind me that when I sign a lease with a housing facility, there's another side. This is the other side when the community makes itself available to come in. 
And then you got to sit there and write all this stuff. And what happens? Management get angry. And sometimes I'll come in, I'll wake up, and I'll find this. You know, somebody coming in and they'll tear my shirt up. And I'm wondering, why would somebody do this to a shirt? Why would this be done to a shirt? You know, that's so aggravating and insulting to have a lease with someone. And here you have pages upon pages. And, and you don't even, you know, you want to keep a good relationship with management. But this is their response against the message. This is their response against the message every single day. I'm held accountable every day to this message that I'm preaching. I'm held accountable every single day to this message that I'm preaching and they test me to see whether or not I'm going to go against the message by folding and by falling. By folding the faith and by falling into sin. The Word of God says in Romans, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the spirit of sin and death. So constantly I'm being judged by my own people that are family, people that are former friends, people that are from former states like New York, California, Florida, wherever, my own country, right? For what purpose or for what reason? Because they're testing to see if this message is real in my own life. And some people say, no, it's not. The guy's a homosexual. We'll prove it. We have videos. We have pictures. But if they had taken me at my word and they had taken God at his word, is it possible that these incident reports and these incidents would not be necessary? would not be needed if they had only trusted in the words of Christ that God loved them without the sin, that God loved them without the doubt, that God loved them without the opposition to his face. Jesus says this, whatever you've done unto them, you've done unto me. So we're talking about connecting the dots. Connecting the dots of scripture. Connecting the dots of God's word. Does God really love us? Does God really love us? Does God really love us? Is God lying to us? If you have a response, wait till I'm done preaching and then you can talk or say what you need to say. Does God really love us? Is God lying to us? The sun that's above our head tells us that we have a loving God. The Creator puts the sun there to give us sunlight. The Creator put the sun there to give us heat. Does God really love us? If God loves us, why then do we doubt His message of love? Why do we doubt his message of love? Why do we not want to repent of sin? Why do we not want to live a life for Christ? Why do we not want to connect the dots of scripture? What are we waiting for to repent at this hour? This day? Why is it every day not a day of salvation for the people of this nation? Why is every day not a day of salvation for the community? Why is every day 
not a day of rejoicing, of ushering someone into the kingdom of God. Why is every day not a day of rejoicing that a brother has been forgiven for his sin? That a sister has been forgiven for her sin? Remember Mary Magdalene, God cast out seven demons from this woman. Seven demons. How many people do you know of that are demon possessed? We don't even see the demon possessed. As soon as we know there's something wrong with them spiritually, we put them in an asylum. But does that stop God's love? Absolutely not. I recently read an article concerning the Supreme Court justices. These were the people two years ago who made the decision. These were the people two years ago who made the decision that people in the community or men who practice homosexuality were given permission to marry. Now, everybody in America is entitled to make their own choice and to go in their own direction. Everybody in America is entitled to love whomever they choose. Love is open and free to whomever. God loved us by demonstrating his love by dying on a cross. These people believe that it's okay for two people of the same sex to go in that direction and take it to the altar. The word of the Lord tells us differently. That's not what he's looking for up in heaven above. That's not what he's looking for in heaven. That's not the kind of unity that he's looking for in heaven. And so he puts us in the world to preach the gospel, to help the world and those in that community to understand that, what he's looking for and what is going on. This is what is going on. But what he's looking for... It really was is repentance. He himself is not looking to do what? To accept what the Supreme Court judges have given permission to. He's the Supreme Court judge of all judges. He is above all judges. He is above all courts. He is above any court that has ever been or ever will be in the world. And so he says, no, I don't agree. Instead, his message of love is, repent and I will give you a new heart. Repent and I will give you a new mind. Repent and I will give you a new way to understand my love for you as my creation. You don't have to go in that extreme direction. You don't have to accept this way. You can accept my love this way by repenting of sin. So I walked out of the apartment yesterday and thought to myself, and thought to myself, I'll go to work. I work for a company that sends people out to do any kind of laborious work that there is, and then we get paid on the same day. So when I get there at six in the morning, there's a few people there sitting down I stayed until about 7.30 and, um, and Melinda says to me, as you know, I, I, I came from Grace Community Church and uh, I was under the, the leadership of John MacArthur, this gentleman here, and I was given a four page letter and asked to leave, right? I was asked to leave his church. I was asked not to associate with the church over there anymore under the accusation of me myself being a homosexual. And I thought, well, this is kind of odd. I'm a master seminary student. I'm not practicing any kind of sexual immorality with the men. Why would I be condemned and given a four page letter to leave? So I left, grieved, and decided to go in the direction of ministry and continuing my life in Seattle. But it didn't continue that way because I became a homeless. And my homelessness lasted 10 years. And you know the story because I've told you several times. Long story short, what I didn't know in the process is that his daughter is a voice in my head. 
I could hear Melinda talking. And Melinda says to me, you need to leave. You're not gonna get any work today. You need to go. And the, the community, and the community that I'm referring to is the community that was given permission by the judges. He said, she said, the community is not going to give you any work until you come down back onto their side doing these things. You know what things I'm talking about? It's what they are known for as a community. But how do you as a Christian go into an establishment to work knowing that you have a community demanding something completely different from you than, than what is initially on the application? And it's like, wait a minute, the woman behind the desk is not asking this of me. The workers that I'm standing around with is not asking this of me. Why would she say that? So I got up and I left the room and I thought, well, this is peculiar. They come out a couple of times. They come out a couple of times and I make my way to the place where I know they would be to give them the service that they need. The point that I'm making, and I have to do it repeatedly. And the point that I'm making is if the community had understood the message on Sunday, on Monday, I would have been allowed to work without having to sin against my Lord and to sin against God. Why does the community demand that when God is saying, accept my message of love? Accept my message of love and you don't have to live that way. I will free you from that. I will give you a new mind. I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new system. I will give you a new way of thinking and of living so you could be free. So this is God's message of love. This is God's message of love. When you tell your child, honey, would you please not go into mommy's bank account and take out $1,500 to go buy yourself a new car? Please, dear, I love you, I respect you, but mommy needs to, you know, make the car payment or house payment. Would you please not do that? Would you please refrain from taking mommy's credit card or daddy's credit cards and maxing it out at Macy's, at Nordstrom, to buy yourself new shoes. Dear, would you please not go to Pioneer Place and shop, shop till you drop? Because these bills that are coming on is really gonna affect us as a family. This is basically what God is saying here. It affects the kingdom when you call us to sin as a church. When we've already dealt with the issue, it's so passe. You know, I mean, it's so yesterday. You mean to tell me I have to go back to living that way again? Oh, no. Wait, are you saying that even now after I just preached the message to you, you're going to ask me to go back and live like that and do those things? I thought you understood the message. I thought you understood you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to live that way anymore. You don't even have to go there. But I guess some people didn't understand or else Melinda wouldn't have said anything to me. When I first came into this country, you all know that I'm a, I'm a, uh, you know that I'm, I'm a foreigner. And uh, when I first came into this country, you know, I was given this. It's a naturalized um, certificate that says I'm an American. Um, and when you get this certificate, there's no, there's no instructions that comes with it. There's no instructions. You know, there's no, uh, this is what you can do as an American and this is what you can't do as an American. But when you become a Christian, there are instructions. There are instructions. And the instructions that are given to us are found in the scriptures. But there is something though that comes with this certificate of citizenship. It's this, uh, this constitution that you have right here. And this constitution, basically, this is one of my favorites, and I'm quoting it from uh, the 13th Amendment. It says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. We're not slaves anymore. That's basically what this book is saying. And it applies even to the naturalized citizen 
If you're a naturalized citizen, you are not a slave. You don't have to be a slave. You don't have to submit to slavery. So then on a Monday, I go to work. Why do I need to hear, hey, bud, you can't work for this company unless you go and do that. Well, I'm reading the Constitution here. And, and I'm looking at the citizenship certificate and I'm saying, I, I don't get it. What does that have to do with our law and the, and the new freedom that I have as an American? It doesn't correlate. It doesn't match what's going on here. Hey, what's going on? Why do I have to go do all of that gymnastics when, when I know right here very well I have the freedom? I think I have the freedom. Don't I have the freedom? A while back, I was so upset by this new way of living that I took it to the district attorney's office. The district attorney's office, I spoke to a Michelle Karen. I don't know if she was the right person to talk to, but I spoke to her and I asked her, why is it that we have to live this way? Why is it that at work, they're demanding that from us. Why is it that at church, or I think it's church, unless it's something else and they're just using that title, why is it that we have to live this way? I, I don't understand. And so, you know, I'm thinking my Bible says God loves me, and therefore because of his love, I don't have to live that way anymore. But now here, I go to work, and the little voice inside says, you have to go in that direction. But the Constitution doesn't say that. It says I'm no longer a slave to that sin. I'm no longer a slave to any way of life. This isn't something that I should be living. So on Monday evening, I get home after going to 24 hours, after searching for a new apartment, I spent the entire day looking for an apartment, a new one, to get away from all of these things that are happening in the apartment. You saw all the incident reports. And the manager always says, you know what, you should probably look for a new place because these things are not going to stop. And I'm thinking, well, it wasn't in the, uh, it wasn't in the lease, and it wasn't in the Constitution, it wasn't in the naturalized process when I went through it, why is it following me everywhere I go? Hey, you need to do that, but I'm here to work for you. You need to do that, but I'm here to worship. You need to do that, but I'm, I'm just, I don't get it, I'm here to study in the library. You need to do that. It's like, wait a minute. This doesn't make any sense. I think I better move out of here. New apartment, you need to do that. Uh-oh, new church, you need to do that. New school of theology, you need to do that. Wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Who is it that's demanding of me to do that? And I'm getting hit here and hit there and my wrist is fractured and my feet are in pain and I'm waking up with cuts all over my genitals. Oh God, what is this? I thought we were free. I thought we weren't slaves. Who is it that's demanding this of me? Why am I being forced to go down there and, 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 and sip on these? You understand what I'm saying? This is not right. Who do we turn to? Who do we call on? If the, if the district attorney says, well, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't do nothing for you. And, and the churches say, I'm sorry, I can't do nothing for you. And the police department says, you know, you better go do that. And you, you contact the US government in the White House um, Office of, what is it? O OAF, Organizing uh, Office of, uh, of something. AFO, OAF, whatever it's called. Organizing for Action, I think it's called. 
you email them and, and, and they don't respond back to you, or office of agency liaison, you try to contact them and they don't come back, I mean, it's like, wait a minute here. There's something not right in our American society that's taking us in the wrong direction and leading us to the wrong conclusion. So when the gospel is preached, it's God stepping into this American society and saying, Beloved, I love you, but I don't love you the way you want me to love you or the way you think that I love you. Beloved, I appreciate you, but it's not the way you think I appreciate you. I will give you freedom in Christ, but it's not freedom to sin against me. The message merits for us to connect the dots. The dots of scripture. You don't have to live in sin. That's what God is saying to all of us. You don't have to submit to sin. You don't have to succumb to sin. Sin does not have to be your master. Sin does not have to be the master over you. You simply need to repent. So on Sunday when I came out here to preach, it wasn't to chastise you. It was to, it's to bring you up to date with the fact that God loved you enough to die on a cross for you. God loved you enough to offer you salvation so on Monday you could freely go to work without having to demand that or be demanded of that. In other words, to relieve, you know, it's like taking, it's like taking a, a load off your back. That's what the message is supposed to do. The message is supposed to take the load of sin off your back. The message is supposed to say, oh, thank God, I don't have to live as a sinner anymore. I don't have to demand that of my family. So the gospel that God wants you to walk away with this morning is no different than what I was saying. If you're entangled in the affairs of this life, if you're entangled and you've been entangled for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, living a lifestyle that you know in your mind is not right, living a lifestyle that you know in your heart is not right and you want freedom you've got to trust God you have to trust him who else are you gonna trust because you submit to the community you know what they're gonna demand of you they're gonna demand that you sin they're gonna demand that you fall they're gonna demand that you stay under doing those violent things, doing those immoral things, doing those things that are going to draw you as far away from sin as possible. How many times must the Christian submit to sin? How many times must the, the Christian yield to sin? We're like robots. You hear it, you submit, and you go. But what if there's another side where you don't have to submit, where you don't have to yield? and you don't have to go. What if there's another side where you don't have to make that sinful lifestyle your own? What if, what if God is telling you the truth? What if there is a real church, a real God, a real gospel, a real salvation? And it's not just a message, but that's the reality that has blinded, you've been blinded from. What if it's the truth that I'm telling you and I'm not filling your minds up with a bunch of lies? What if we could go to work without that? We could go to church without that. And we can keep it within the context of marriage where it belongs. Does not the Bible say in Hebrews, do not defile the marriage bed? Why would God lie to us if he wanted us to defile the marriage bed? Hebrews, Hebrews says this, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, 
For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Fornicators and adulterers. We don't want you to be judged. We don't want you to be judged. We want you to be saved. We want you to be forgiven, pardoned. And so as a community, how about taking God's word into your community and reviewing it and seeing it for what it is, God's word. It's not just a chastisement coming from Kevin's mouth. It's not just a, a, a so, something there to beat the Bible inside of your head. But what if it is the truth? And that you don't actually have to live that way. You can enjoy your family, your wives, and your children. And it doesn't have to become something immoral between the parent and the child or the parent and somebody outside of the, the family. The Bible says, come and let us reason together. The Bible says to the people of Isaiah, come and let us talk this through. What if we're ignoring the only thing that God has put on earth to save our souls what if we're ignoring the only way Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the Father but through me why would we want it any other way other than the right way is it because God is not responding or we're perceiving that God is not responding so we're coming up with our own wisdom our own ideology what if what God is saying is truth? What if what God is saying is truth? Why live, you know, it's like a person who falls in a pit. And you throw a rope to them and say, hey, grab the rope. If you grab the rope, me and my friends are up here and we're going to pull you out of the pit. And you say, no, no, that's not a rope, that's a snake. I see it dangling, I see it dangling. And he says, yes, I'm dangling it so that you can do what? So that you can see the rope and grab it. You're in darkness down there. You're in darkness in that pit. Let me throw the rope to you. What, you see the rope wiggling? He says, no, that's a snake, that's a snake. He says, no, that's my rope. He says, no, that's a snake. He said, no, that's my rope. I'm trying to get you out of the pit of darkness. Grab the head of the rope and climb up and we'll pull you up. What if this is what this gospel is saying to all of us? You say, but we're not in darkness, Kevin. No. Is there nighttime? Yes, there is nighttime. But there's also spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness where you can't see God for who he is. You know there's a God, but you can't see Him for who He is. Because sin in your heart has suppressed the truth. And therefore, there is no space in your heart for Him. And so you hear the message, but it doesn't stick to your heart. It's like throwing seed, corn seed, on dry ground. Instead of moist soil that will take in the seed, and over the course of time, we'll allow it to grow. Everybody knows the community's position. But what if the Christ position is just as real, or even more real, than that of the community? Everybody knows the community's position. But what if the Christ's position is even more real than that of the community? How many times have you heard that I've sinned? How many times have I been out here preaching, preaching a message of salvation? What do you think is more important to me? My sinning with you or your salvation to me? You've all heard.
word that I've seen. You've all seen it in pictures and videos. Either somebody has sinned against me while I'm asleep or I sinned with them. They've got videos, they've got pictures, they've got this and they've got that. I'm dealing with a community of sinners. What do you want? Nobody wants to take the message of God's love seriously. Nobody wants to accept the message of his salvation from sin. I can't get a job or keep one unless I'm involved in sin. I can't join a church unless I'm involved in sin. I can't finish seminary unless I'm involved in sin. I can't marry a woman unless I'm first sinning with her father or sinning with someone that looks like her dad or her or however you people do it in the community. What do you think is more important to me? The sin that we commit in secret or the salvation of God's love that I've been giving you? What does God have to do to get you to believe Him? What should He do next for you to believe Him? What should God do next for you to believe that He's talking to you in this generation? the people who have not heard this message going to respond they're gonna respond exactly how they responded after the message on Sunday they didn't hear the call to repentance they didn't hear about God's love therefore they're not gonna even know that the message was was preached and God was asking them to to accept his message of love that Christ died on the cross for our sins. Hey, nice lady. We need more preachers on the street to come and do that. Would you like some snacks, sir? No, thank you. Come to me. What you doing? Amen. And you're gonna have you gonna have fruit. Even though it may not seem that nobody's listening to you. But they're listening. That's you right. keep on praying. You keep on hollering out what you want. Amen. Amen. You keep on. Keep on. They hear you. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone. What is it going to take for us to believe that it is written from the hand of God? The scripture says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for training, for correction and righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. It is a call to repentance. And that means not just here, in front of friends and family, but it's in those places that have been built so you and I could sin. If it was up to me, I'd burn down every single one of those buildings and remove the sin out of the sight of the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 3 says this Good. 
Actually, I'd like to read you the first three verses. Scripture says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it did also with you, and that we may be delivered from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. And may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Why is it that our hearts are not stirred to take God at his word? Why is it that we're not stirred to take God at his word? Will God protect us from the evil one? Is the Lord faithful? Will you allow the Lord to direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ? Will you allow the Lord to lead, to direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. The word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified. What is it going to take for America and Americans to embrace the gospel according to Jesus. The love that God has been pouring out on us in creation. What is it going to take to embrace the message and to embrace the new life that is in Christ? You can denounce me and call me whatever you want because I'm not staying here forever. My day of death has already been determined. My place of rest has already been chosen by God. The priest or the pastor that's going to say the words, whatever they say over my gravestone, has already been written in the mind of God. I'm not staying down here. I know that my time is coming to an end. And I know that my Redeemer lives and will continue to live even after I'm gone. The message will continue. So sooner or later, God is going to remove me out of your sight. Just like he did when he removed me out of Seattle. After 14 years of preaching to a stone-hearted people, God will eventually do that here, either by taking me to another city or by death, or putting me in a church where I could do some ministry among the saints. But the question is, is your response to his gospel? The message is your response to his love. You say that the message doesn't apply. We don't need to leave the community. The Lord says to the church, come out from among them. Come out and be free. Have nothing to do with the kingdom of darkness. That's what he tells the church in Corinth. 
He says to the church, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst, and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. If that is what God is telling the church, after salvation, get away from these unbelievers. Why do you demand of us to do that for you as a community of unbelievers, knowing that we are saved from that sin? Why do you demand the church to go in that direction with you? When you know we're professing Christians. Why do you put those same standards that you yourselves despise, you yourselves hate, you yourselves reject, you yourselves kill people when they dishonor you by demanding that from you? Why do you now request that from the church and its leadership? And all we say is God loves you and wants to be reconciled to you through Christ. We're not shooting you with guns. We're not giving you bombs. We're not threatening you with gillettes and knives. We're not sticking syringes and needles under your feet. We're not cutting you in between your toes. We're not putting laxative in your drinks. We're not beating you when you're asleep. We're not putting you in jail to sexually assault you. No, we're giving you an opportunity to make it right with your creator. And it is your creator who says there's something wrong with our relationship. And therefore he calls his church to come out from among them. Anytime you see me here, it's because he's talking to the church and say, Hey, come out from among them. You who believe in me. You who have faith in me. You who choose me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. This is the Lord's call, not Kevin's call. The Lord doesn't want us to be slaves of sin. He doesn't want you to be entangled in the affairs of everyday life. He doesn't want the Christian to become so comfortable in his or her sin that they forget that he's called us to sanctification and honor. He doesn't want you Christians to become so comfortable in your sin because, oh, now they've accepted me and they're giving me a job. I can still practice Christianity in the church on Sunday and then come out throughout the week so I could work. What if we can live among the unbelievers and not do what the unbelievers do? What if we can live among the unbelievers and not practice what the unbelievers practice. What if we can live among the unbelievers and not denounce our God? And not be held accountable to live to their, to their standards of living, which whatever it is, whether it's immorality or idolatry. Is that okay? Can the Christian live among you without practicing what you practice? Without the enticement of the flesh. Without being fired from their jobs. Without being evicted from their homes. Without being electrocuted in their bed. Beaten in their bed. Molested in their bed. Driven out of their cities where they've lived for years. 
Is it okay for the Christian to live among the unbelieving without feeling like, oh God, they're going to kill me if I go to work this morning? So the Lord says, come out from among them and be free. Are we connecting the dots this morning? Are we connecting the dots? If you love the Lord, the dot that he adds to his love has come out from among them. That is the call of God. Come out from among them. Is that is that possible in a in the 21st century? Is it possible to love the Lord more than you love the flesh? Is it possible to love your creator more than you love your your sin? Whatever that sin may be. Is there any that want to give their lives to the Lord this morning? You may deny me if you choose to, but don't deny the gospel because there is no other name under heaven by which men are to be saved. You may reject me if you choose to, but don't reject the gospel. You may call me whatever you want. You may put me in whatever category you choose, but don't do it to your creator because it will cost you your eternal life. I can't do anything to you. But what God will do to you is far greater and far worse. And what he says to you on that day is worse than any cursing word you have ever heard coming out of my mouth. He, all he has to say is, depart from me, you wicked. I never knew you. You workers of iniquity, depart from me. I never knew you and cast you into hell. I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to have the other experience. I want you to be welcome into heaven, not rejected of the Lord. I'm not gonna tell you to take a chance on Jesus. This isn't a sales pitch. I'm not going to tell you to take a chance on the gospel. I'm not selling you anything. The breath that you take comes from above. The life that you live is a gift from God above.
What's gonna happen the next time I go to a job? What's gonna happen the next time I go to a job? What are they gonna whisper in my ears next? You can't walk in there unless you practice. You can't fill out an application for this apartment unless you, what, have sex with the manager? You can't come into this restaurant unless you what? Give it to the bus boy? What, what, I mean, a, 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 how much liberty and how much freedom Years ago, they used to tell us we can't sit in the front of the bus. Years ago, they used to tell us we'd have to sit in the back of the restaurant. Years ago, they used to tell us we can't, you can't even come in here. What are these new American standards? What are these new American standards of sin? What are these new American standards of sin? It's almost like the sin of racism and the sin of segregationism and the sin of bigotry and the sin of unbelief has taken a whole new and it all went sexual. That was the hidden problem. All of the sins, all now slavery, I mean the whole thing just went sexual. And that's the very condemnation that God is talking about in Romans 1. We were not turned over to slavery. We were not turned over to racism. We were not turned over. And so God comes back and says, hey, I need to clarify something. I'm demonstrating my love for you through the death of my son. Will you please repent? Will you please repent? I'm burning your brothers and your sisters in hell, in Hades right now. I'm burning your former generations, those who did not believe. Those of the generation of who? Jonathan Edwards. Why would a charlatan take the time to give you a gospel? Is it for the pennies and the nickels and the dimes and the quarters in your pocket? Is it for the millions in your Wells Fargo bank account? Is it for an opportunity to eat your flesh? Why would a charlatan waste your time with a gospel message? What could he possibly be hoping that you give him? An opportunity to rule over you? What, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Your salvation, what is in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? Leadership? Friendship? Sex with women? A million dollar bank account? Fame, perhaps? Will you make me as famous as you made this man? Where is he? Is this what I'm going to get out of it? Fame? What am I going to get out of it? Or is it possibly God wants you to be saved? And this is the message he's given you in every generation. But you're hardening your heart and saying, I will not believe. I will not change. I'm an American woman. I'm an American man. I'm white. I don't need that garbage. So does that mean that you're not going to die and be judged? I'm European. Does that mean that you're not going to die and be judged? I'm rich. Does that mean that you're not going to die and be judged? I have blonde hair and blue eyes. Does that mean that you're not going to die and be judged? I'm taller than you. Does that mean that you're not going to die and be judged and stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Everything that you add to saying that you're better or you have more, God takes away from you. away everything you take pride in you suffragists God takes away every opportunity God takes away when you're in that casket friend it doesn't matter if you are rich if you are white if you are tall if you are thin 
It doesn't matter if you were famous. When you're in that casket, it doesn't make a difference what you were, what you had, how far you went in education. None of these things matter. When you're in that casket, that's it. The Lord says, that was it, I gave it to you. I gave you the time. I gave you 60, 70, 80, 90 years. I gave it to you. Now, it's time for you and I to meet face to face. And God is going to open the books, like it says in Revelation, and from the books of Revelations chapter 20, then we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we have to answer for the glorious life that we had on earth. Where we did what we wanted, we went where we wanted, and we acted as we wanted. And we didn't answer to nobody. Let me say this lastly. You're free to be and to do whatever you want in your community or outside of it. But be mindful that the church is called to a different standard, a different way of living. The church is called to come out of the sinful life that you're still stuck in. Just keep it in the back of your mind that we're called to holiness and sanctification. And when you see the church fall flat on its face, it's because God says, and I'll read you this passage in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It is because God said, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. But that doesn't give the church permission to live as sinners. It doesn't give the church permission to do whatever they want to do and go back into that life of sin. You see, just because you're forgiven, it doesn't mean that you have the right to go and live like an unbeliever. So be merciful to the church. When they tell you I'm a Christian, refrain from judging us as much as you would your own. Because we have a Savior and a Creator that we answer to. Just be mindful that when you run into a person who is a Christian, that God has called them to a different standard of living. Be merciful to that person because they have a Creator to respond to and to answer to. They have a Holy Spirit inside of them leading them. They've got a set of scriptures that they have to read and believe and practice. Yes, we have grace, but not grace to sin. Yes, we have grace, but not grace to do whatever we want. Yes, we have grace, but not grace to take up Satan on his offer. Which is what the unbelieving have done in denying God and Christ as Lord of their lives. So be merciful to the Christian who says, I'm sorry, I can't live that way. Can I still have the apartment? Can I still have that job? I understand you don't believe what I believe, but can I can I have that apartment without the that sin you're asking for? Can I have that job with that? Can I have that promotion without that sin? Without the sin. Without the hit? Without the hurt? I I without breaking my wrist, without using my mom to do that to me, my dad to do that to me, without calling me to live like this, because that's not the Christian way. It's not the way of sanctification and honor. Be ye holy for I am holy. That's what God said to Israel. And that's what God says to the church. And that's what God is saying this morning.
never intended for us to live without his word. Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for preaching, for reproof, for training, for correction and righteousness. Without the correction, it's like me taking that sign right there and ripping it off. It's like me taking out the red lights that stops the traffic from coming south and stops the traffic from coming east. If God takes away his word, then we're going to have chaos in the church and chaos in the world. You need the word because that is God's voice. The word is God's voice to all men. You don't want the word. Well, why don't we just rip off all of the signs? Then people can drive however they want. Why don't we take off the lights? Take the red lights off of the cars. We don't need it. We don't need these instructions. Why not go to DMV and remove the book? We don't need instructions on how to drive. We don't need a license. Drive however you want. We don't need a lease. Tear the lease and party hardy every night. Huh? We don't need a lease anymore. Party at my apartment tonight. Party at your apartment tomorrow night. Party at the next man's house tomorrow night. Right? We don't need an, a constitution. We don't need a declaration of independence anymore. Party, 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 party. Yeah, everybody, come on. Come on, go to the community. Let's get down. Woo! We don't need laws and instructions. We don't need the love of God. All we need is an opportunity to eat each other's flesh. Huh? That mm, 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 uh, 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 tasty flesh. You want to give your life to Jesus? Pray. Father, forgive me for my sin. Pray. Lord, I repent of my sin. Pray. Lord, bless me with your Holy Spirit. I denounce my life of sin. In Jesus' name, amen. It begins in your heart. And it, it requires your confession with your mouth. And it begins with your mind changing and accepting God's message of love. God's message of love reduced to one word. God's message of love reduced to one word. Is it true or is it a lie? God's message of love reduced to one word. Is it possible that God has reduced his message from Genesis all the way to Revelation to one word? Everything that the Lord has been saying since Genesis 1-1 reduced to one word. Is it possible? Can it be true? All you rich men, CEOs, established businessmen, huh? You people who will, I mean, you stay in hotels that size, paying for room for $300 a night. Is it possible that God is saying, how about take this, this right here for free? Look at this, a free message. Huh? I have an entire book to throw at you, but he's saying, can you just take one word out of the book? 
One word out of the book. Not even the word repentance. Not even the life of repentance. Out of the whole book, one word. How about just the word repent? Not even the word repent, poor lenders. Not even the word repent out of the whole book. This is God's message of love. And if you bring this into the job, no more that. And if you bring it into the apartment complex, no more that. If you if you bring it into the, the churches, no more that. Oh no, why? Because you can get married and have a family. A real one. A church family. A family between a husband and a wife. A family that includes God, the Father and the Son. One word. You bring this word into your businesses. You bring this word into your churches. You bring this word into your families. You put this word in your children's mouth. Instead of crack cocaine. Instead of the other pipe that produces HIV. Put this word in the mouth of your children instead of the cursing that you hear that comes out of mine, which I got from you growing up. Put this word in the heart of your children. Put this message of God's love in your Congress. Put it in your army. Put it in your navy. Then you don't have to go across the seas and murder and kill so many people. Father, I pray for Portland and ask that you would help them to repent and ask that you would help them to turn away from sin. Lord, let these people accept the message of love, the doctrine of repentance and salvation. It's not just a Sunday message, it's an everyday message. It's an every moment message. In season message, an out of season message. It's not just on Sundays, but it's every day. Children are born and people die. And there are priests at the bedsides of those that are leaving. Father, I pray for the salvation of those who heard the message and want to believe, but perhaps they can't believe because they're afraid of what's on the other side of the community. Because they're afraid of what life will be like in the church. I don't know, I don't want to become some preacher. I don't want to become some yeller, yelling at people and getting no money for it, no sex for it, no salvation for it, rejected by everyone, hated by everyone. I don't want that. That's what everybody else is doing. But what are your responses, Lord? What is your response to, the, to your own message in the heart of these people? <laughs> Father, I pray that you would be patient with the people as they deal with their sin, as they work out this message. As the seed has been planted in their mind and the seed has been planted in their hearts. The Bible? Father, I pray for their salvation. Come on, brother, you got a priest to lose here. And that they would repent of their sin. Some of the law and the prophet love thy God and love thy neighbor. In Jesus' name, amen.